Welcome to the Going North Podcast, where we will deliver you tips and techniques to advance yourself and anything you decide to do in life. I am your host, Dom Brightman, and every Thursday, I will interview authors, especially self-published ones from various walks of life, who will deliver you information and inspiration to help you charge forward. On a quick side note, be sure to check out my book, Going North, on Amazon.com. It's available on ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Now let's get on with the show. And on today of the Going North podcast, we have, you guessed it, another author, but not just any author. This author is going to give you some advice on his experience in sales because he is currently the president and chief sales officer of the United States Sales Resources. And he's also an active community church and youth sports volunteer. And he's also a New York Giants fan. So, well. <laughs> <laughs> Said. Yeah. Uh, the glutton good. for punishment. That's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it hasn't been a good year for them, but they've had some good years in the past. And you may be wondering, who am I talking about? I'm talking about the wonderful sales management expert, author of The Cadence of Excellence, Mr. Matthew McDarby. How are you today, sir? Doing exceedingly well. Better than I deserve. Dominic, it's uh, great to be with you today. I appreciate the appreciate the chance to to talk with you today. Oh yes, me too, me too. So I gave a short little introduction, a short little glimpse into the life of Matt. But mind filling in the gaps where I may have missed some things. No, I, yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I spend my time working with large and middle market companies, coaching and developing their sales managers. And I started my business about seven years ago. I've got this company, and then I have a joint venture with an old colleague of mine that's called Specialized Sales Systems. And both of those businesses are about helping sales managers and salespeople to grow. And how can they be more effective? How can they help their customers more? How can they create more value for them and for their businesses? And so, you know, I spend a lot of my time helping people to grow and get better. And it's great work. It's a lot of fun, uh, even for people who feel like, they're, you know, they're going into this process with me because they, you know, maybe they haven't been able to hit goals in the past. Or, you know, even they look at their work with me as an opportunity to grow. Right? There's a lot of optimism and a lot of forward-looking that goes on in our conversations. So really enjoy what I do. And uh, I love the general premise of your, you know, your series here and, and the kind of focus that you have. I mean, I think if we can deliver a positive message to people that, you know, there are some concrete ways in which they can get better at what they do and to really help other people out in the process. It's not just, it's not about money. It's not about having all the, the best toys and the best things, but it's about being really great at what you do, which has a, it carries a lot of satisfaction. And so uh, I love talking about it. So, so uh, my challenge here today will be to keep my answers brief <laughs> and, and focused because I've got a lot to say on the subject matter of selling and sales management, but I'm sure you'll guide me here with, with your with your expert questions. Hey, it's a okay because it's it's one thing that folks always need more information about it's selling because I mean we're selling every day of our lives. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah, absolutely true. And there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, right? And so that's that's really what my focus is. So, so any experiences of dealing with folks who've done sales the wrong way? <laughs> God, haven't we all? I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, as a buyer, like if you bought anything, so my, the world in which I operate is mostly like a business to business sale, complex sales. And I don't mean that the solutions are complex or the people. I mean, just the process of selling is complex in, in certain environments because you know, there, there are many people involved in the decision making process. And if it's a big solution to a big expensive problem, it could take a really long time. That's, you know, it just is, it's challenging. That's what I mean by complex sale. But, you know, whether it's a complex sale or whether it's a simpler sale, whether it's business to business or business to consumer, I think we've all had experiences as buyers that make it crystal clear what bad selling looks and feels like as we've been on the receiving end. And the thing that I think is common when we look at all experience that we would say experiences that we where we would say god that was that, that that person did not do a good job of selling 
selling to me or selling to others. It's when they make you feel like they're putting their agenda before yours, right? So, so the buyer's the buyer's agenda always has to come first. Right? The customer, it's so cliche, but it's it's you know so many cliches are are the way they are because they're true and they've been true for a really long time. But the customer is always right, you know, and 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 that even applies to the selling process. And salespeople who don't get that, who demonstrate that they're really there for themselves, right? They're there just to sell something and not to help a customer solve a problem. They're really there to make money, not help a customer make more money or, or you know, a, a seize an opportunity for themselves. As a buyer, you just know it, right? It's, it's, it's not always easy to describe, but it feels, you know, a little creepy, a little slimy. That's why salespeople unfortunately get we don't as a profession always have a great reputation because and i won't knock specific types of salespeople, but you know cert, certain kinds of salespeople get uh, have a pretty bad reputation and and the reason for that is you know they just give they give you this vibe that they're all about themselves so i think the thing that you know kind of flip that around the thing that is true about really good to great Salespeople is that they get it that you get they you have to put the customer first. Right? You, you've got to first understand what the customer wants to achieve. First understand the problems that she or he wants to address before you can sell anything. And your whole process needs to be about figuring those things out first before you sell anything. And that's even in a simple sale, right? And can you just ask a basic question like, "What are you trying to achieve?" Or you know, "Why why are you here today? Why do you want to buy this or that?" Can you tell me a little bit more about how you're going to use it? Just basic question. And you'd be shocked, or maybe not, Dominic, you'd be shocked at how many people who are in sales jobs today don't even bother with those questions. And they just go straight to the straight to the pitch or straight to the close or straight to the demo. And that's what bad selling looks like. <laughs> Is that a good good way of describing it? Oh, yeah, because that, that last statement, indeed, it kind of, Reminded me of Gary Vaynerchuk, where it kind of equates it to the 19-year-old who tries to go for home base on first date. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 What are we doing here? <laughs> yeah. Don't. Uh, yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so after experiencing some bad sales, I guess, and then learning how to sell well, will probably be one of your one of your best. Piece of advice for those who want to transform their sales career. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I'll skip past some of the really super obvious stuff because I think anybody who's been in sales for even just a little while, they've probably been through some training that tells them to ask questions. I'll skip past that because I think you know anybody can ask questions. <clears throat> Not everybody does a good job of listening to the answers. And I think that <laughs> that actually is the key skill. I mean, it really is. I mean, you think I'm joking. It's it's true, right? That you, you would think that people would get it when they, they get put through a sales training class or workshop, either they you know, they paid for on their own or that their employer puts on for them. And almost universally they're all encouraging salespeople to ask questions, right? And you know, about you know, the customer's background and what they're trying to accomplish and but again, that's kind of a universal thing. You must ask questions. Okay, great. What am I supposed to do with the information? That's the part that I think Sales training in its many forms, and there's a lot of tr- sales training programs out there that you know some are great and, and a lot are not. I don't think they place anywhere near enough emphasis on just listening, because if you're really listening, then the follow-up questions where you you know where you dig in, right? You go to the next level with the customer, and you really clarify, you really understand their motivation, and you really understand the things that bother them, and you know what kinds of things might help them which ultimately leads to a discussion about you know, what, what you have to offer to them. But that's all predicated on listening. So I would say for those who are, you know, kind of if anybody's listening to this who's, who's, who's in a sales role or who has been in one, who's struggling a bit, I guess I would pose the question that it's not necessarily, well, it's rhetorical because it's just you and me talking on a podcast, but they should challenge themselves with the question, am I really listening to the answers? And am I listening to understand? Or am I listening to respond? The salespeople are notorious for, you know, they've, they've got their, they've got their canned responses to objections. So they've got their, you know, their special way that they always answer, you know, common questions that customers ask. And that's all well and good. But where you can really differentiate yourself as a salesperson is if you're really listening. 
And if you really understand, because you, you know your customers are, you know, unless they're unless they're you know, for one reason or another holding information close to the vest and they don't want to share things with you, customers who, who who are experiencing problems and want them solved tend to share a lot of information if we would only listen to it. So that's my number one piece of advice to get to the next level from wherever you are. Consider, am I really listening to understand, and what am I doing with that information? Or am I listening to respond? Because that, you know, th- there's a clear difference there. You know, listening to respond puts you in the, you know, average to poor camp. And listening to understand and then make connections with what you have to offer, that's what really great sellers do. Yeah, great advice indeed. Great advice indeed. Kind of reminds me of Mark Sanborn's The Encore Effect. Seeing every opportunity with the customer as your first opportunity. Don't just... See it as, oh, I can just use this can of response. Right. Yeah. I've heard somebody say, and I, I recognize the title that you've just mentioned, the, uh, I don't know where this comes from. I'll say it and I won't, I, but I can't take credit for it that, that when we're selling to people, um, you know, the, one of the really key factors in whether we're successful as salespeople or not is whether we're able to build trust with customers. Even, again, even in a simple sale, right? That can be the differentiator. In fact, there's a really quickly, I did a, a piece of research a couple of years ago, actually, it's about three years ago now, where we asked buyers, both business to consumer and business to business buyers, was there a scenario where you had a choice between suppliers of, you know, pretty much the same thing? They had an equivalent product or service. Were there any times where you chose to do business with, with someone who was not the low price provider? And if so, why? So for those who said, yes, I have, you know, I had a range of choices. They were all kind of in the same. They all had roughly the same thing to offer, but I chose to pay a little bit more than I needed to. The number one reason for why they did that was they trusted that supplier more. So more than half of those people who paid more than they probably had to said, I just trusted that that person more. I was willing to spend more. I don't want to deal with people that I don't trust as much, so that was worth it to me. So, um, and the point I'm making here is that I think in every, relates to what you just said, Dominique, which is in every sales interaction, like if you treat it like your first one, right, you, you, you really are curious and you're asking questions, you're really trying to understand, that's a trust-building exercise. And you either have, in every sales call, you're, you're either going to build trust or you're going to erode it. And there's no in between. So, you know, are you going to are you going to go into this next sales call with a customer with the intention of building trust? How would you do that? Well, ask them some smart questions, but really listen and show them that you're processing the information. It might that build trust versus going in there with your own agenda and not listening and just telling them whatever you plan to say, regardless of what comes out of their mouth. That's going to erode trust, right? So it's a really simple way of thinking about it. Am I going to build trust in this call or am I not? If not, let me rethink my whole approach because that's not good. <laughs> so and with trust is such, it's like currency. Uh, you know, we, we have to either build up our account with customers or not. And the best way I think is to really be customer focused and really listen. Yeah. Cause listening is a huge thing, especially nowadays, especially if the customer has issues and problems, they're really open to just venting out and then you can just learn mm-hmm. ways to just help them solve their problems. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is you have to have a good product, right? You can't sell garbage, even if, you know, if a customer trusts you and then your solutions are terrible or the product is subpar, <laughs> that's obviously going to be a problem. But if you've got products that are on par, if you were the one at the table with them who is listening and helping them think through their issues, right? And just listening and asking them questions. Would it help if? Have you experienced this or that? What happens when you do this? If you're the one at the table, that's where all the difference is made, right? It doesn't matter ultimately if somebody else has a product that may actually even be a little bit better. But if the customer realizes that it's the experience they have in buying from you that really matters, then they may in fact go with you even if you have a product that's just sort of on par. I think we've seen that, right? You, you, I wonder if you or, or others listening here can think of a situation where whether, you know, maybe it was a car or a home or it was a business decision where there was so much value in the interaction with the person that you said, you know what, I could probably buy this from somebody else, but I'm not going to. That, I think, is sales in its highest form. If you can be the difference 
And again, I think this applies to all forms of sales. If you can be the difference, then that's the way you take control of your sales career. If you really, really want to be great and take great satisfaction out of the job and earn well and grow and you know get more opportunity, then you've really got to be focused on the customer. You really have to be a great listener and, and be ready to help them kind of process things and be on the same side of the table with them versus kind of sitting across the table like an adversary. Be an advocate instead. More wise words indeed. <laughs> Yeah, I just don't want it to make it look like one of those bad mafia scenes at the table. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm making an, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse, Mr. Customer. <laughs> and I'm from North Jersey, so I, you know, that's, that hits close to home when you say, you know, I'm sitting across the table. But, uh, <laughs> Heck yes. <laughs> That explains the Giants fan stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's more a geographic thing than uh, than anything. But yeah. yeah, I've been here in the in Maryland for about twenty years, but live live and die with the Giants, and there's just no way around it. Sorry. It's all good. <laughs> that shows loyalty, and not the bandwagon folks who buy a jersey every five games because a certain team. Is, is yeah, not. yeah. The one you mean the ones who go back and forth between the Ravens and the Redskins jersey, depending on the outcome of of the weekend. <laughs> Oh, God, we yeah. see that around here. <laughs> wait, wait a second. Weren't you were? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So with your extensive background in sales and even starting your own business of helping sales managers, in addition to your book, what books have really inspired you to just start your own business yeah. and to keep selling? Yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch. I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm pivoting in my chair here to look at my bookcase. There's a few, right? So I've got my tops, my sort of my classics, and then there's some other ones that I've been reading over the last little while. So in general, great stories I love. But in, when it comes to uh, selling, one of the classics. Now I used to work for a company called Huthwaite, H-U-T-H-W-A-I-T-E, and there's a guy named Neil Rackham, R-A-C-K-H-A-M, who is famous for writing a book called Spin Selling. And it's not like spin, like you know Washington D.C. spin. It's an acronym. It's a it's an investigative selling approach. So spin selling, rethinking the sales force. Those are two of Rackham's books. There's a book written by a business partner of mine. It's called Love and Selling by a guy named Dan Smeda, who recently teamed up with another friend of mine, Ed Wallace, has written a book called Business Relationships That Last. It's a great story. It starts with a uh, he's a guy out of Philadelphia. It starts with a Philadelphia cab driver of all things, and, and how he taught Ed lessons about customer relationships, and it's a, a, a great one. And uh, what's one more? There's another one that I that I like. It's written by a friend of mine, a guy named Dave Brock, and it is the Sales Manager's Survival Guide. I think I'm getting that right. We've, you know, my book is also about sales management. Dave, you know, his book touches everything from strategy down to tactics and it's it's you know it's it's a really he's a great guy great book you know generally i just love stories about people who've overcome so i'm looking at the rest of my bookcase here and here's what i've concluded dominique and i think this is one of the things that you and i have in common among others you know being a lifelong learner is really key if you want to achieve you know, anything that's important to you. I was going to say achieve great things, but that's not really what I mean. I mean, you know, because achieving something great is kind of a relative thing. For me, achieving something great means having my own business, being a master of my own destiny, you know, having my children know me, you know, not being on a plane all the time as a VP of sales for someone else. So that's what I mean by great in my life. That's what I've been able to do, but it's by, that's because I've learned and not always from my own successes, right? I'm reading books, learning from things that I'm not doing well. But there are so many good books on, on you know, customer relationships. Um, I would recommend that people look for books on in general on, on the psychology of buyers. That's why Rackham and his books were so great. So long answer, but that's what you get. If you could ask me about books, I can give you, you know, 30 more, but I don't think we have enough time. That may be another episode. <laughs> it is all good. I mean, I work in a library. I'm around books all day, so. <laughs> yep. 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 We're like peas in the pot with that, and I love it. More importantly than the books, I love the fact that you said that your kids know you, <laughs> which is mm-hmm. which is great because like in, in hustle and bustle of life, just having your own business or whether it's working the nine to five, which is probably really eight to six, and then yeah. all the commute time and everything, and then you just get home and the kids 
want to say daddy, daddy, or mommy, mommy, and then it's like, ah, oh, no, I'm tired, and they just call out in the bed and then go through the whole process over again. It's it's just really important to just not only have your family, but mostly your kids to just know you and be like, hey, my dad was there. He, he came. Yeah, and I can't put a price on it. I, I know too many guys, and I know there's people who are going to be listening to this thinking, God, I, you know, I, I can't, I wish I could, but I can't do that. Well, I, you know, I would say, regardless of what walk in life you may be in right now or what your role is, I think there's always opportunity to grab a little bit of your time back and, and repurpose it, take control of it, you know, and, and it's easy to say, not easy to do. I mean, shoot, Dominic, the guy, the people that I coach and train and develop, one of the number one problems they have is there's just not enough time to do important things well. And usually the solution to that problem in the job of a sales manager is, okay, we've got to figure out how you're using your time. And maybe there's some things that you're saying are important that are, or that appear to be important on your calendar that are not in fact important. They're just sort of urgent, which is different. But I think the same thing applies in life, right? If you, if you judge that the time with your family, your spouse, and, and making sure that you know, you're there at important moments for your children or your family, such as it may be, whatever your whatever your unit is. It's just a decision. And, you know, it is possible to block out time and, and, you know, make time on the calendar to do those important things and do them well. And that just doesn't, that doesn't apply only to business. That's life. And so much of what we do, we take ourselves into our roles. If we're not satisfied with our life outside of work, the odds are really, really good that we're not going to be satisfied with the work either because it's just work. So, yeah, I think it's the, one of the best parts of what I do is I help people in a very specific capacity in sales management jobs to work out that. How do I get more time to do important things well? And it's, it comes down to reprioritization and acknowledging what's really important and what really isn't. And it's, you know, in some ways for people, it's kind of therapeutic. I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> not a therapist, <laughs> but... But honestly, I mean, if you listen to some of our conversations, you'd think maybe that's where I come from. And, and why is that? Because I ask questions. I listen to the answers. You know, I'm not there to respond. I'm there to understand. And then late in the conversation, I might, I might offer some ideas or give them a chance to reflect on ideas. And that's the work that I do. By the way, that's selling, too. That's what great selling should be. And it's, it's planning a few questions. It's listening, trying to help somebody else process some, some things, some problem or opportunity they haven't been able to kind of get their brain wrapped around and and then giving them some ideas to reflect upon. And then if it's right, it's right. So I, I crack up at the you know, the, tr- the sales folks and the trainers who are, you know, all about, you know, always be closing and closing <laughs> techniques. And I mean, it's all manipulative and it's all nonsense. It's, you know, the, the, the great selling really in its highest form, typically looks like it. closing is nothing more than a natural sort of conclusion of a process that's that's been very much customer focused and very much centered on customer discovery, self discovery, and that's why this is such a great profession. It's it's a you know wonderful discipline if you really know how to do it well. And if you don't, please, for goodness sake, if you're listening to this and you haven't had any training, the things I'm saying sound kind of like from another universe. I'd say. Well, go get the training. Go get the books. Go read up on customer psychology. Find out how customers want to be sold to and do that. Don't manipulate. You know, don't be focused on your own agenda above anyone else's. That's not what selling is. Maybe it was one day in the past. That's not what it is today. And I don't think it will ever be that way again. Yeah, it's true indeed because customers are so darn smart now that Google's out there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Why would they? Yeah, they don't need to deal with, you know, they really don't need to deal with salespeople in a lot of circumstances, if you think about it. So, you know, what are you going to do if you're a salesperson? What are you going to do to make it so that they, they really value that interaction with you? Because if you don't do anything in particular, they're not going to value it. Like you said, they'll just do their homework on Google and they'll just buy whatever they think they need to buy. And that's the reason why you see there's a lot of chatter on social media and, and you know, a lot of people who say, oh, well, there's going to be, all, you know, hundreds of thousands of salespeople will be out of work in the next, you know, you know, several years or decade. And I think that's a little bit dramatic, but, um, <laughs> yeah. but there are definitely going to be people who are selling today who will not be because they wash out because the market doesn't have any room for them anymore. You know, for those listening, I think that's another choice, right? Am I going to prioritize my time toward important things? And then two, Am I going to be part of the solution versus the problem? Am I going to be the sort of 
salesperson that customers seek out because they really appreciate the experience? Or am I going to be the kind of salesperson that customers want to avoid like the plague? <laughs> No. I don't know about you. I know which one I would want to be. So, you know. Yeah, I don't think I want to be the leprosy or the plague or anything. No, no, that's bad. <laughs> it'll, it'll probably be bad. It's like sometimes you run into those network marketers, and then one day yeah. you, for just some reason, someone just feels crazy. Be like, oh, unclean, unclean, it's the pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> They've come back. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but I mean, you know, in all seriousness, that's kind of the way customers act sometimes. They sm- they whiff that approach like, oh, God, I've got to get out of here. I've got to run as far away from this person as I possibly can, you know. There's no pressure tactic. There's no clever trick. There's no turn of phrase that's going to change their mind. And the customers just, they don't want to deal with it anymore. You know? it's just, and, they, and I think the key is, and this is kind of implied in what you said, they know based on research, they know they don't have to deal with that approach anymore. You're going to find somebody else. It's true indeed. <laughs> because one time I was in a meeting and the trainer must have saw me go from my bag to leave. And her feet were right in front of me as I, as my head was down reaching for my bag. And the thought ran through my head. It's like, oh, shoot. I'm not going to be able to this place alive, am I? <laughs> I'm not getting out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, That's yeah. when he start looking for the fire alarm. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, shoot. I'm not going to be able to leave here today. Uh, I'll need to get out safe, though. <laughs> I mean, I'm still talking to you, so that's good. So <laughs> I'm still alive. Yeah. yeah. I, I made it out the danger zone. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Been dispensing all the good advice. And heck, even part of your book, Chapter 1, so, so far it's probably still my favorite because it talks about finding your operating rhythm. What really does made you decide to put that as the first chapter of the book in Cadence of Excellence? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, I, I wrestled with that, and it was that with the help of my editor, a lady named uh, Meredith Maslich from Eaton Press. She she really is the one I, I have to give credit to because you've written a book, and, and so the process is, you know, it's challenging. It, it's, you know, you've got all these ideas and this content, and you see some threads between them, but when I was outlining the book with Meredith, she was like, you know, you really have to start here. You've got to start with the cadence because my, you know, as she read it, you've got, you know, you've got the, all these stories and ways to approach common problems that sales managers have to deal with. But if they don't fix this time thing, this cadence, you know, this, this problem where they don't have enough time to do important things well, then they really can't get to any of the other stuff. So that's the reason that we open with the book because we open the book with that with that chapter because that's that's the bottom line right you can you know as a sales manager you've got to build a, a great team you've got to keep them motivated you've got to create a certain sort of culture positive you know kind of coaching and development culture if you want to keep good people and and help them to grow you know you've got to really understand what value you can deliver to customers and make sure your people are pursuing the right opportunities There's a whole bunch of things you need to do as a sales manager, and those are all sort of common challenges or opportunities. But if you don't figure out how to make time to get all that done, then you end up right in the same place where a lot of, you know, kind of average sales managers find themselves, where they look at the clock and it's like, you know, time is the enemy. They can't get to important stuff. They're, you know, they're stuck, you know, with forecasts and, and doing administrative work and improving expenses and dealing with, customer issues and dealing with internal issues and, you know, answering to the big boss and all that. And they never get to important things like helping their salespeople to plan sales calls or coaching their people on a strategy to win a piece of business. Those are the things, ultimately, if you think about it, those are the things that are most closely connected to the, you know, the performance of the team. It would be like a coach on a on a playing field, a football coach. So you mentioned I'm a youth football coach, and, and that's one of the things that I played football in my life. Um, you know, that would be like the coach sitting on the sideline in a football game and reviewing statistics, not calling plays, not giving players feedback, you know, not interacting with with you know the quarterback when the when the offensive team's on the field. Um, it would be ludicrous, right? I mean, if you saw that on in, in the course of an NFL or a college or even a high school game, 
you'd think, well, God, that, that guy doesn't belong to be in that job. <laughs> well, unfortunately, a lot of, that's how a lot of sales managers operate. Right? They, they don't even bother to make time for important things and instead get sucked into administrivia and reports and, and long, long answer to a simple question. The short version is if you, if you, if you really want to get control of that most precious resource, which is time, you've got to make some choices. And you've got to set a cadence or a rhythm with your team where you are essentially virtually guaranteed to have those critical planning and development conversations and that those are on the calendar and they're just as important as customer meetings. Right? They don't get moved. They don't get canceled. They always get done consistently. And there's a certain rhythm and pace at which you do those things. So that's why I did it because all the other problems that you can solve or opportunities you can pursue as, an, as a manager – they all, you know, they, they, they all go by the wayside if you don't figure this this problem out the, of where, I, you know, you can't get important things done well. Does that make sense? Well, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense, dude, because, I mean, kind of like with the whole time management thing, it's how can you manage something that you don't know about? It's like having a bank account. If you don't know how much money's in your account, you don't know how much you can budget, how much yeah. you can spend. So it makes perfect right. sense. Right. Yeah, and then you go and spend all your money on the wrong things, and then you're surprised when you don't have any left, and, you know, time is the same way. Yeah, and the sad part about time is you can't get it back. <laughs> nope, you sure can't. Yeah, you can always borrow money. <laughs> can't borrow time. That's, you know, it's, and we only we all only have so much, not to be too morbid, but, uh, you know, I mean, let's, let's maximize it, and that's the point, right? So I think that was, like, the crucial thing we had to start with. And I think that you know people who are not just new to the job of sales managers, but even those who've been doing the job for a while, I hope that their reaction to that first chapter is one of like relief and, a, and it's a bit of an aha sort of moment where they're like, oh, okay, all right. So here's an example where somebody who had a much bigger – there's a story of a guy with you know a huge job, right, who had to figure that same problem out and came up with a pretty simple solution that I think is instructive for everybody. So if a guy like that with a $2 billion business with, you know, several hundred if not thousands of people reporting to him, if he, if he was able to solve that problem of time and not having enough time to do important things well, well, then somebody who's new sales manager or uh, who has been a sales manager for a while but has a team of six or ten, then they can certainly figure it out. So I'm hoping when they see that story in the chapter and the bit of advice, the guidance that I give in that section, they'll be like, okay, I can do this. And, and, and once they do that and they work on that for a while, then they can go and pursue some of the other issues that we talk about in the book. So that's that's why we laid it out the way we did. Beautiful indeed, beautiful. So in speaking of time, if you were 25 mm-hmm. in 2018, what piece of advice would you give to yourself? God, if I were 25 in 2018, whew. Now, it's 22 years ago, by the way, Dominique, so I've really got really, <laughs> really, really got to go back in time and remember. So, great question. I think what I would do kind of relates to what we were just talking about, but I would tell the, the 25-year-old version of myself, don't waste time. It's so precious. And figure out what you really value and devote your time to that first. And then... You know, anything else that follows that first thing will be more satisfying because you won't be wondering, am I spending enough time on those most important things? I think that it's a kind of a universal truth. It's about life, not just about work or just about sales management. So that would be my advice. Hey, 25-year-old, don't waste time. <laughs> you know, it's fun to go out and party with your friends. That's cool. You can do that every once in a while, but make sure that you're getting to important, that, you know, first things first. Classic sage advice indeed. So for the folks at home who want to keep up with all that you're doing, buy books and all that good stuff, where can we find you? A few places. I'm on Twitter, I'm at M McDarby, and uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can just look me up at Matthew McDarby. And then my, I've got two company websites here. I'll say them really quickly. The one that I think might be of general interest to people is uh, United Sales Resources, and that's uh, usr-llc.com. That's the sales management development company. But we've got a very exciting new venture called SpecializedSalesSystems.com. 
So if you want to find me, you've got Twitter and LinkedIn, and then the business websites. This new venture is super exciting, kind of driven by technology and reacting to what the market has been telling us about sales training for a long time. We'd rather build our own than go out and buy somebody else's, you know, kind of pre-baked methodology. So that's what we're doing with specialized sales systems. So, uh, yeah, please. And the book, The Cadence of Excellence, is on Amazon. Get it on, in print or on Kindle, and if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription, the book is free. It's part of the uh, that Kindle Unlimited program. So for those of you listening who are Kindle addicts, please go and grab a copy, and you can get one in print as well. And this has been great, Dominic. I really appreciate the time and, and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, me too, indeed. Me too, indeed. It's always great to learn from other folks who are doing some good things, especially fellow authors, and give them a, another opportunity to just share them. Thanks a bunch for your tuning ears on the Going North podcast. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Be sure to, once again, check out my book, Going North, on Amazon.com and CreateSpace.com. And if you'd like, feel free to follow me on social media at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all at Dom Brightman, YouTube at Dom Brightman. And if you want to connect on LinkedIn as well, I am there at Dom Brightman as well. Go out there and make the rest of your